All right. Welcome everyone to our nature photography happy hour. We're really glad that you are joining us virtually. Uh, my name is Maria Dar. I am the programs coordinator at Shoal Creek Conservancy, and we are joined here today with Ian Wright. Um, before he gets started, um, I have a little bit of an introduction that I'd like to go through, uh, and then we will get to all the juicy photography details that Ian will share with us today. So first, uh, I would like to remind you all that this event is kicking off our fall tours. So typically prior to COVID, we would have uh, monthly in-person tours where we would uh, you know, provide the same kind of educational content that we're providing virtually right now, um, but we would explore different topics uh, so that you could be introduced to the creek in a really comfortable, safe way um, with myself and whoever is the uh, person sharing their expertise for the month. Um, next, uh, next month, we're gonna be pairing with tree folks. We're gonna do a virtual tree ID tour. Um, in September, we're going to be pairing with the Capital Area Master Naturalists, and uh, we're going to be exploring some topics about um, soil and plants and other things along Shoal Creek. Uh, we're going to be pairing up with the Travis Audubon Society in October to do some birding. Um, in November, we're going to be doing a geology and fossil tour with the Austin Geological Society, and then in December, we're gonna do some urban stargazing with the Austin Astronomical Society. So definitely don't miss out on any of those. Um, as long as it is safe to do so, the priority is to have at least those later in the year to be in person, um, but we'll definitely keep you posted on which ones will be virtual and which ones uh, will be uh, in the flesh on, on the creek. And we definitely want to give a big thank you to Google and to HEB. Um, their generosity allows for us to continue to offer this educational outreach opportunity free um, and, you know, of no cost to the public. So thank you. And please visit our website to sign up for those. Um, and in case you are unfamiliar with what Shoal Creek Conservancy does, our mission is to champion Shoal Creek, the trail, and the entire watershed. So we do this as literal advocates for Shoal Creek, and this manifests itself in our programs, um, which, you know, typically under the best circumstances, we would be having monthly volunteer cleanups and monthly educational tours. And, uh, you know, and we also will engage the community um, and get feedback on the priority areas of improvement. And so our efforts in mobilizing stakeholders um, basically has enabled us to provide the city with digestible descriptions of exactly what Austinites want for Shoal Creek, which is really awesome. So that has led to our trail plan, which outlines, uh, outlines key improvements and priority projects along Shoal Creek, and then has also allowed us to put together the Watershed Action Plan, which outlines ways to address the interrelated water issues that affect Shoal Creek. So uh, without further ado, um, I would love to hand it off to Ian so he can get started. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Maria. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you and, and the Shoal Creek uh, Conservancy for having me out. This sounds like whoever's out there watching come back every month and check all those out. Those I'm going to do that. Those sound phenomenal. And uh, yeah, there's nothing like getting out in person uh, and talking to experts in their field. I'd love to talk to a tree expert or a birder that can help me ID all the birds that I'm terrible at identifying, uh, but I can take photos of them. <laughs> but in lieu of that, uh, I'm hoping this will be a good virtual experience to at least give people a, a bit of a taste of nature. So, um, so yeah, if you guys are interested in learning how to photograph nature, that's kind of what I'm here for. Um, I'm going to go through a, mostly a PowerPoint um, covering the basics of photography. I'm mostly a macro photographer, but I do other wildlife. I do people shooting. I do lots of stuff. Um, so I can talk at length about all of that. But we'll focus more on macro. Uh, I'm going to talk generally about photography principles and then talk about gear tips adaptations for cell phones. A uh, little bit of point and shoots. I don't really do much of those, but there are some options there. And then SLRs, which is mostly uh, what I 
shoot with. Um, I'll talk about some options there. If anybody has any questions on that, uh, you can email in to the uh, registration link. You can reply to that email, and we'll see those uh, in real time. Maria can help me out if we find anything else. Uh, other than that, I'll just kind of go through and talk about um, photography. So let me get into that PowerPoint. We might even have time for a uh, live demonstration. That would be fun. Uh, I've got at least yeah. at uh, least one little jumping spider here. <laughs> yes, and if anybody has any questions, just as Ian said, please uh, just write an email straight to Maria at ShoalCreekConservancy.org. Um, the information for this evening was sent out via that email address, so you can just reply to the the invite, and that will come to me, and then I'll we'll share it at the end. Perfect. All righty. So excellent. Uh, so this, I shamelessly stole one of Ted Eubanks' uh, photos. This is part of Shoal Creek. The awesome thing about Austin, Marie and I were actually just talking about this, uh, it is in large part uh, how much nature y'all have access to uh, down there. Um, and it's there's some just absolutely stunning uh, phenomenal areas. So we can, I'm not really gonna talk about landscape photography, uh, <laughs> but it's a great place to go out and practice that. And uh, as long as it's a safe to, I would absolutely encourage y'all to, to get out there and uh, breathe some fresh air uh, with a mask on. Um, so I'm gonna talk about sort of the basics of photography and where I wanna go with that um, is talking about what's called the exposure triangle, just the sort of three main principles that go into properly exposing a photograph, um, issues y'all might have with that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some technicals, focal lengths, uh, minimal focus distancing, what do those mean? Um, again, this is more geared to pretty much intro photographers. You may have heard some of these terms, but not quite know uh, exactly what they mean or how they apply to uh, macro shooting. Uh, I'll talk about a lot of lighting options, macro photography especially, uh, typically relies very heavily on lighting and lots of DIY or make your own solutions uh, for coming up with diffusion of the lighting to get nice, even illumination of your subject. Uh, we're usually dealing with extreme issues with um, focal distance, uh, extreme apertures. I'll talk about what all that means. Um, so lighting is, is really key for macro photography. Um, I'll talk briefly about some elements of composition, uh, all to get you guys to have a sense of uh, what goes into making a photograph, all the technicals that go into making a photograph, and then getting towards more the artistic, how do you sort of make a better photograph? And I'll show you show an example of me starting with a pretty crummy photograph that I got it to a better photograph, um, and I'll, I'll show the process of what goes in to that. Uh, we'll then also talk about Again, cell phones, uh, point and shoots, SLRs, the, the various cost options, some gear suggestions if folks out there might have a, an SLR, they maybe bought a kit lens or something and are looking to get into macro photography. I can provide some, um, some suggestions, some, some gear critiques and reviews, things like that, um, and some recommendations of what's, what's a good product out there. Um, so very basically um, what goes into Photography, uh, what goes into making a photograph. Photography is literally light writing, photograph. Um, so you're producing an image onto some kind of photo receptive sensor by exposing that sensor to light. Uh, in the old days that was on film. Now we have a digital sensor inside our SLR cameras or even on your cell phone, but they all have a lens with an aperture that lets a certain amount of light in uh, and goes on to the, the image plane. Uh, so again, used to be film, now we do it with these little, um, however many megapixel sensors, each of those little pixels is receptive to light and produces an RGB value that goes into making a 24 megapixel photograph or whatever it is. But the basics of that are how much light you let in, uh, how long the shutter is open for, the size of the aperture, things like that, that go into combining to, to make a proper exposure. So a proper exposure, the, the three main components of this, there's, there's other options that we'll talk about, um, are the aperture you shoot at, the shutter speed that you shoot at, and the ISO, what used to be called ASA, ISO or ISO, uh, is basically the sensitivity of your sensor. Um, this still applies to cell phones, uh, although usually the cell phone 
doesn't give you too many options to uh, play around with these. Same with point and shoots. You have a little bit less um, flexibility there for many of those. Uh, and then SLRs tend to have at least a manual setting where you can go in and physically change all of these if you want to. But what this triangle kind of shows is how each pushes and pulls into making an exposure. Uh, and they're usually given to you as, as these exposure values uh, here, if it's underexposed or overexposed. Um, I'll start with ISO is one of the easier ones to understand. It basically just is the sensitivity of your sensor. Uh, so the higher ISO number, ISO 6400 or you know higher, uh, is going to be much more sensitive to the same amount of light. So it'll expose a brighter image given all the same settings. Shutter speed uh, is measured in seconds. You might have one eight thousandth of a second would be a really fast shutter speed. Uh, or you could hold the shutter open for 30 seconds or several minutes uh, on some of the SLR cameras. Uh, and obviously you're letting in a lot more light there given all the same settings, and that's going to uh, overexpose your image, brightly expose your image. Uh, the aperture is the actual uh, hole in your lens. I can even uh, show an example of that with a lens here. Hopefully you guys can see that the aperture actually opening and closing, that's the uh, mechanism um, to allow, to sort of mediate how much light you let into your camera uh, or onto the sensor plane. And that uh, also affects the image. The, the wider open that aperture is, the more light you let in all given. So you can combine all these elements to get a proper exposure. And understanding what each of these does and the other consequences each of these has for the image and the type of image uh, you produce will really help you get familiar with speaking the language of, of the camera and start uh, getting better images and especially seeing if you, you know, get not quite the image you're looking for, you can think about these elements as to how you can improve um, that image. And this again works for cell phones uh, up to SLRs, although it might not be as explicit uh, in some of the cell phones. Um, what you can see if you have a properly exposed image, like in the in the center here, you have a good mix of shadows and highlights. You're not really blowing anything out. Uh, there may be some underexposed areas, maybe some overexposed areas. Uh, however, if you drop the exposure by either lowering your ISO, uh, closing down your aperture, uh, or maybe speeding up your shutter speed, so you all of those let less light into the sensor, basically, um, you'll end up with a, a darker image, an underexposed image and that's measured in exposure value uh, in stops of light uh, and same thing if you do the opposite of any of that and you get a much brighter image you tend to blow out a lot of these highlights so that's usually what happens when somebody says hey can you take a you know picture of me standing on uh, on uh, congress avenue bridge with a beautiful sunset in the background and you have the flash on you get flashed the background is black and then your face is, you know, looks like you got hit by a truck and headlights. <laughs> and you have this disconnect in, in the balance of the image. So understanding that, and we'll talk more about this throughout the, the hour, uh, will help you kind of correct some of those problems and, and try to get a better resultant image uh, at the end of it. So um, how those are controlled on an SLR uh, camera, you usually have this um, exposure button uh, right there, exposure compensation button. Uh, there are other ways too in the in the menus to use your autofocus button. Many SLR cameras have a dedicated autofocus button that can also lock exposure uh, or do things like that. And this is also you can do this in in cell phone cameras. A lot of cell phone cameras have uh, these little sliders here, these brightness uh, sliders, and you can bump up or down. The exposure now behind the scenes the camera might be controlling its aperture it might just be doing the iso it might be doing the shutter speed it might be doing all of those um, usually there's again a little bit less control there uh, but you can at least have a slider for that um, some of them also have exposure sliders with a lock uh, on them and again you could expose uh, it, in a brighter area lock that exposure and then move to a darker area but keep the settings so that you actually um, bright, brighten up, or maybe vice versa, uh, darken down a bright area, or brighten up a dark area. Um, and you can go actually go in on your cell phone and uh, lock the exposure and then recompose 
and get a better exposure for your image. This will be really important when it comes to the tips I have for shooting macros with cell phones. Oftentimes, these sliders that have a lock on them, they lock both the exposure and the focal distance. So I'll talk about um, the really common case of getting a cell phone shot where you have a beautiful photo of a brick wall behind the subject that you were trying to photograph and your subject is totally out of focus. Um, that slider with a lock button can really help you preset the focus and then do the same principle, come over to your subject and get a better shot of that. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so again, just for edification, ISO, you see this a lot in astrophotography. Lower ISOs, uh, say 200, is gonna be a, a darker image than a higher ISO and, and you can expose more uh, your, your camera is more sensitive to the light that's out there. This is especially important in astrophotography where you can't add flash or, you know, there's, there's not really other ways to enhance the, the amount of light that you see. And maybe folks have been out there trying to photograph Comet Neowise. Uh, and if you haven't, I would highly suggest that you do. Um, and that's one way you can bump things up. If you, if it's very faint in the image, you might bump up your ISO, for example. Uh, now shutter speed, again, is measured in seconds. The longer that shutter is open, the more light that gets let in. But here's where we come to the sort of artistic aspect of these technical details. The longer you hold your shutter speed open for, the more blur you're going to get in an image. Just like if a race car passes by you and it just looks like a smudge, um, you need a very fast shutter speed to freeze that action. But you might want to have a slower shutter speed to sort of communicate motion in your subject. You might not have a choice because you may need a slow shutter speed to let in enough light. Um, and that's something you could adjust by bumping up the ISO, maybe can give you a faster shutter speed for the same exposure value, right? And you can use this in wildlife photography. Here's an example of a hummingbird photographed with a fast shutter speed. Although again, I think there was flash used in this image, this is my image, um, that is doing some of the legwork there. but. Let's pretend it's just with the fast shutter is freezing this action. Now you can do this with macro as well, and you might want to do this with macro. If for example, you're John Abbott of Abbott Nature Photography, uh, John and Kendra do some amazing work, some amazing photography, and they've gotten really into photographing insects in flight, which can actually lead to some really interesting observations. Uh, this for example is a carrion beetle uh, that no one had ever really observed in flight or noticed too much in flight before, these are some of the first images, still crisp, sharp images of these beetles in flight. And you can see what it's doing in the, in the photo there is it's actually using its middle pair of legs to hold its wings open, uh, folded over themselves like gull wing doors on a DeLorean. Um, and the undersides of their elytra are actually brightly colored, aposomatically colored. So when they're in flight, these things look like a, on when they're normally walking around, they're just a sort of black beetle um, with some coloration on top. But when they flip their wings over in flight, it's thought that they mimic a wasp or mimic a, a bee uh, and they're aposomatically colored to warn predators off, say, hey, I'm a, I'm a bee, you don't mess with me um, in flight. And this is a really cool image that you would need a fast shutter speed um, to accomplish. Technically, they're actually using the, the shutter, the speed of the flash to freeze this, but I'm not gonna get into the technicals of that. Another way you could use shutter speed to communicate motion is you know, the, the movement of a, a army ant uh, colony moving across your screen. You might want a blurry image because this is communicating the speed that these ants are moving through their environment, for example. So these things are the technicals, but they impact the resultant image that you end up with. Aperture is probably the one that has the most impact to your image. Um, it's measured uh, by f-stop, and it's a measure, again, of the opening or shutting of your aperture. Uh, uh, it's measured in f-stops. A small f-number, uh, you're down here, means a really wide open uh, aperture, but you're letting in a lot more light uh, for the given all, all the given exposure. But what that means is you also have a really shallow depth of field. This is what wedding photographers love. Uh, they shoot at like f1.4, 1.2, uh, 
and they get a photo where your eyelash is in focus, but not your pupil <laughs> or your pupil is in focus, but nothing behind you, not your aunt on her ninth glass of champagne. Um, you want to blow that all out of the background, right? So you want this clear bokeh uh, behind you. So that's when you would use a low, uh, a very small F number, a big wide aperture, right? Uh, and you can shoot in lower light or higher shutter speeds, all things equal, being equal. Larger F numbers up at F16, that's usually where we live in the field of macro photography uh, because we're trying to maximize as much depth of field as we can. If you've ever looked through a microscope, that's the physics that we're battling um, when we're photographing a small ant that's this big. Uh, you only have this narrow slice of focus uh, when you're adjusting a microscope lens in and out and then boom, there you see the focus. We only get that little small window. So in uh, upping the aperture to F16 or something like that uh, gives us a little bit more depth of field um, that's that real small, narrow aperture. You get a lot more in focus from foreground and background. Um, now the issue with that is that you lose a lot of light, right? So one way you can, uh, overcome that is by slowing your shutter speed down or increasing your ISO, or as we'll talk about in a bit using flash. And that's, that's where flash becomes really important for macro photography, especially. Um, so here's just an example. This was shot, I think at F4. Uh, cherry blossom and what it means again to the actual composition and the artistics of your image is i know that every single person viewing this right now is looking directly at this cherry blossom uh because that's the one that grabs your attention not these blurry ones back here whereas if you took this image at a uh, higher aperture uh more of the image would be in focus from foreground to background you even get the background of this ivy in the background, which may or may not be distracting to your view. If I wanted you to just look at this flower, I would use a small aperture just to select that out. Uh, so that uh, explains a little bit depth of field. What else is going on with depth of field is it's also dependent upon the distance between you and your subject and your subject and the background. So if I'm very close to my subject and the background is a mile away, I could shoot it any aperture um, and I would still get a really blown out background because it's just not close enough to render any detail uh, and vice versa. If I'm very close, I could shoot at F 1.4 and it, you would still probably see some detail with the background. So you can control that by controlling your aperture, but also by controlling where you are and where your subject is in relation to each other and in the environment. And I often will choose a lens or a, a position to where I can isolate an organism against a very far away background so that I can really take all of that uh, distraction out of the image to, to get a clean image uh, of my subject. Um, it's especially important with macro because we're dealing with close working distances when you have to get really close to a, a bee on a flower, something like that. Uh, and we're dealing with these narrow, this narrow slice of depth of field that you get. Um, you can see that this is another fantastic photographer to check out, Nikki Bay. Um, he's a great shooter based out of Singapore. Uh, here's a really cool mayfly with these turbulent eyes. Uh, males tend to have these. It's thought that they are uh, important in, in um, mating to help find females, this massive compound eyes on top of the head. Um, that's the focus of this image, certainly. Uh, but you can, you also can't tell, you know, how many legs does this thing have? What is, what do the wings look like? You know, we have such a narrow band of focus that that's what your attention is brought to. Now in macro, there are ways that you can expand uh, your depth of field. One of those is focus stacking. I'm not going to talk explicitly about that. I'll just show kind of an example of what that means. Um, but the other ways you can do that are just upping your aperture and you usually have to bring in additional lighting to get that. Although this was might have been shot with a fairly high aperture given that the subject is so small. Um, this is an example of a focus stack. Alex Wild is another fantastic photographer uh, that y'all should all follow. And if you live in Austin, uh, turns out he's he's right down the street. He's the curator of entomology at the, uh, the insect collection uh, based out of uh, UT out at Brackenridge Field Lab. Um, and he's a just phenomenal photographer. Um, this is an image he put together of something like dozens and dozens of images stacked together. And you can just see every detail in the pollen grains kind of from front to back on this, on this bee. Uh, this is one I took of a chrysidid uh, wasp, a cuckoo wasp. And you can see all the detail from the, from the front to the back of the wings. Um, 
the way that this works, I'll show you an example with this cool tiger beetle. Um, you can see here I've got, you know, sharp focus on the front, focus all the way to the back. But this image came from this image uh, where I only have the antenna, the front antenna in focus, right? And these back tarsi, for example, are totally blown out. There's not a lot there. So the way focus stacking works is you can go slice by slice by slice through an image and then combine them all together to get the resultant stack of images where the algorithms that you stack with, whether that's Photoshop, uh, Helicon Focus, Zareen Stacker, there's a number of stacking programs. Uh, it takes those elements that are in focus and then just combines them all into one uh, image. I say all this to say this is pretty advanced technique, but there are some SLRs, uh, especially the Micro Four Thirds type of cameras, the new Sony's and uh, Olympus models, things like that, that offer focus stacking in camera. And what they end up doing is taking something like 60 images where they electronically adjust the focus as they go, and then they piece it all together, kind of like your your cell phone does when it takes an HDR image and it says loading HDR. What that's doing is it's combining multiple images to get a broader dynamic range of light. You can do the same with focus, a sort of a dynamic range of focus, a range from A to Z uh, of focal points and stack them together. That's all I really say about that. There's a lot of technicals about how you can do this uh, that I'd be happy to talk with offline to anybody that that is interested. Um, one thing I did want to mention is uh, focal length. You'll probably see if you're pricing or or looking to buy a macro lens. What do you do? You buy a 60 millimeter macro lens, a 100 millimeter macro lens. What do those mean? Um, lenses are measured in millimeters, uh, and that's essentially the the uh, measure of the zoom uh, that you would get. Those that that Nikon P9000. I think they've updated it now. It has like 36 or 42x zoom, something like that. That's like the equivalent of a thousand millimeters or so uh, of zoom. What you can see in the image on the left, that's taken with something uh, very short angle, a very wide angle lens, something like a, a 15 millimeter wide angle lens. And then you can see the image on the right is this basically just this square and that's all the way zoomed in, right? So that's with, this is with a, a long lens, maybe a 200 millimeter, 500 millimeter, something like that. And you can use all of these in macro. Um, this, this is a 500 millimeter lens and it's so big it barely fits in the screen. <laughs> and this I would not recommend for macro, but you can use it for macro. And I'll talk about an example of how to do that. Um, or you could have, you know, a really wide angle lens. This is a this is a fisheye lens that I have on this camera, um, and those take in a lot of the the background. So you can use those to zoom in really close. Uh, although we'll talk about minimum focus distance, or you can still get close with some of these wide angle lenses and use them uh, to show the background uh, as well, ugly or not. <laughs> And uh, we'll we'll talk about how to maximize those for macro photography. Um, so the minimum focus distance, what you want to worry about there, that's also uh, that's usually reported in uh, inches or millimeters. Um, and where that starts on an SLR camera is from the uh, from this little circle with a hash line through it. That's that's where your sensor plane is in the camera. And then minimum focus distance is measured outwards from that. So if this is about six inches, it'd be oh about here. And I think that's about what this uh, fisheye lens is. The the smaller your minimum focus distance, the closer you can focus on an organism or on your subject, and thus the bigger it will be in your resultant picture in your frame. Um, cell phones and point and shoot cameras they usually have these small lenses. Uh, on the front of the camera, and they're usually best at their shortest, uh, at their at their wider fo wider focal lengths. There aren't very many good options for telephoto zooms. I don't know about the newest iPhone. I think they have a telephoto on there. And there's always those those clip-on lenses you can buy that are like the periscope. <laughs> I've never tried one of those. Um, but what's great about cell phones being good at having uh, at their shortest distance uh, is that is optimum for wide angle macro photography. So cell phones are actually really good at getting up close to an insect, taking a shot at a wide angle uh, and capturing some of the background in it and still getting a good detail 
uh, image. And that's what I would encourage you to do uh, with, with cell phones. They can make for some great images. Um, again, it's on SLRs, it's measured from that sensor plane. But this can impact lighting options. This is, again, something if you're looking at a macro lens to purchase, um, think about where that minimum focus distance is, how big that means your subject will be in the resultant image, and what that means for lighting options and how close you have to get to your organisms, because that might impact the animal's behavior and how you're shining a light right up in its, its face or getting close to it. That may be difficult to do. Um, that said, you could do extreme uh, wide angle macro. I told you Nikki Bay is, is phenomenal. Uh, this is with this big apparatus of lenses on top of relay systems on top of what's called a CCTV uh, camera. This is a relay lens system. Um, so he has a small little closed circuit uh, lens for, for a closed circuit camera right up in this dragonfly's face to get, this is in Mozambique, uh, to get all of the habitat behind it and just, just this really cool image. But you have to consider lighting and how close you get to the organism because his minimum focus distance with that is this. <laughs> so he's right, I mean, right up in the dragonfly's face. I don't know how he didn't get it, how it didn't fly off. Uh, Nikki just must speak dragonfly. Um, but actually, you know, you can, if you observe and understand insects and spiders and whatever your subject is very carefully, you'll learn when it's at rest, when it's comfortable, how you can slowly move in closer and closer and closer, when to push it, when it looks like the dragonfly might fly off and you need to back away. And you can work your way closer to get an image uh, or get close uh, like this. So speaking of lighting, there are a lot of different lighting options. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, what you can do for cell phones, uh, especially cell phones have their little pin flash uh, right, right on the front of the cell phone, but that's usually pretty harsh. Um, it works okay for parties or something like that of people, but if you're trying to photograph a spider, uh, it's a little bit small and harsh. One thing you can do is just simply add, or if you're also just trying to focus and, and find the thing in your cell phone, it can be a little hard. You can add some supplementary lighting um, with a, like a small flashlight. You could add one of these um, continuous lighting uh, LED uh, screens, uh, LED grids. Um, or they even make these uh, selfie rings. I, I guess this makes your makeup look really good for Instagram uh, that you can clip on your cell phone. But you could use this for a jumping spider uh, and show off a jumping spider's makeup uh, on her on her chelicery uh, would be a great, much better use for this. I don't know why they advertise this to Instagram models. Um, but those are all continuous lighting where the light is constantly on and then you're exposing with that. There is a system, I don't think this company exists anymore, called Trigger Trap, um, but there's Miobi or something. There's a number of cables where you can actually plug in a cable and download an app to where uh, you can get, you can use one of these hot shoes to fire a actual speed light, an actual flash uh, from your cell phone. Uh, and that can open up actually a big world of possibilities for different types of lighting, different types of shooting, especially macro. Um, if you're so inclined to, to go down that road, you could fire off one of these, which is a speed light uh, that goes, you know, typically on the hot shoe on top of your SLR camera. So now speed lights are definitely one option for SLR photography uh, and lighting. Um, another way to go would be to use some kind of twin flash uh, system where these flash heads are sort of modular and they can move around. You can aim them wherever you want to go. And my current recommendation right now would probably be this set, which is the Mikey, M-E-I-K-E, -E, I think I'm spelling that right, uh, MK24 system. It's a great uh, infrared, uh, not infrared, wireless uh, radio, radio frequency triggered uh, solution um, that you can modify. It's, it's, it's very versatile um, and is very good. The other thing I would suggest, which is what I'm currently shooting with, uh, if you have an SLR, this is a great quite inexpensive, relatively speaking, uh, macro system called the KX800. And it's branded under different names. It's, it's Laowa or Venus makes it, but you might also find it as Kwong Ren or a number of these other brands. It's called the KX800 Twin Flash. Um, and that's a great little flash unit where you can position those grapple arms uh, wherever you need to, to, to fire the light. And that's what I have diffused 
through a piece of a white folder, uh, and then I'm diffusing each of these flash uh, heads with a little bit of foam there and lighting up this big luminous block of light on top of my subject when I use my uh, twin flash for macro photography. So there's lots of ways that people, when you get into macro diffusion, I just had to put this in because there's so many crazy macro diffusion ways uh, from like a Pringles can to a carton, a, a milk jug, anything like that. What really helps, especially with macro, is getting something in the way of your light. You can even do this with the continuous lighting with a, with a flashlight for your cell phone. It helps if you get just like a piece of uh, foam or even like a like a paper towel, any kind of like packing foam, something like this, and just um, shine your flashlight through that or shine your, your um, uh, LED uh, video light if you have one of those, or if you have any kind of flash, put some kind of diffusion in the way. Even like down here, a, a paper plate I've used, or a, a foam, whatever, plate, styrofoam plate, I've used those, I've used just a a paper towel or a tissue or anything I can get my hands on. And it really does help. That's a, that's a really good tip to just get you started seeing the light and seeing what impacts that makes to, to the quality of the light in your photograph. Um, <clears throat> another sort of artsy thing to pay attention to in photography that I'm not going to talk too much about, but just a brief introduction to kind of make your photographs better uh, or make, make them look, makes big improvement to the sort of visual aesthetics of an image is paying attention to composition, paying attention to what really goes into that rectangle of pixels that makes up your picture. Um, keeping in mind that the human eye, the human visual system, the human brain is wired, hardwired when it looks at something visually in the landscape or in a picture, right? Our mind's eye goes absolutely to brightness and then to sharpness and then throughout the rest of the image. So if you have a white, bright, hot spot in your image, that's where your eye is going to go. Then it's going to go to whatever is sharp around that and then throughout the rest of the image. And you can use that to your advantage to compose an image where you put the highlight where you want it to in the photograph to chase your viewer's eye around the image. It's this this composition is I like to describe it as like if you've looked at an image and you just can't look away from it, it's there's something about that image where, man, your eye just stays in the image. That's what you want to emulate um, with your, your photos to make a really great photo that you love. Um, one way you can do that is it really helps to provide a little bit of tension in the image by putting your subject, the main subject, in one of these power points in the image, one of these intersection lines where if you divide your image into threes, into uh, three rows, three columns, um, getting your subject a little bit off center or a little bit in one of the corners, that, that really helps. You can use leading lines. You can use S curves, anything through the image to get your viewer's eye to kind of stay inside the frames. And you do want to pay attention to the kind of the frame of the image. I can't tell you how many great photos I have where there's a stick in the side of the image and it's not a big deal or you can maybe crop it out but if you just reposition yourself a little bit you'll get a much better clearer image where you don't have these distractions that take your viewer's eye up out of the frame you want to keep them into the frame so i'm going to show a photo here and i can guarantee you already uh whoever's watching this i know exactly where their eye is going to go to first and it's going to be to the mouth to the red bright mouth of this Katie did by another excellent photographer, Peter Nesgrecki, whose work I'll show some more of. So boom, there it is. And the reason that your eye goes right to that is both it's bright, it's colorful, uh, it's sharp. So your brain is going to go right there. And there's this great use in this image of leading lines. This is a really cool behavior image as Katie did in, in a defensive posture. Um, but it also is really cool because the background's out of focus. And then the lines here, you can see all these lines of the antennae, the arms, the wings, the legs. They all kind of guide you back to the center of the image where there's that bright spot that can't help but catch your eye. So it's, this is an image that I have a hard time looking away from. It's just very eye-catching. Um, here's another image where you're, you're, uh, of Peter Nesgrecki's uh, where you're focused on this 
this beautiful grasshopper, looks like a Romeliad lubber grasshopper on the ground. You might wander back into the background of the image, but then you're drawn back to the brightness and the colors and the, the uh, sharpness of, of that grasshopper in the front there. Um, so I'm mostly gonna put this graph up so people can pause the, the YouTube video later or something and just do a comparison. This is a, a comparison of things I was thinking about um, when making this, this presentation about the difference between cell phone point shoot SLR. You can take all of these images that I'm gonna show with anything, but it certainly helps to have tools that are more that are easier to use and SLRs I would I would put into that category. That said, cell phones are are probably, well, I don't know anymore. They might not be the cheapest option. You could probably get a point and shoot camera for hundred bucks these days and the iPhone eleven's like a thousand. So, you know, there I think that's that is blending together and merging now. Um, but cell phones can have stunning image quality too. So uh, they also have small sensor sizes, cell phones, point and shoots. Uh, SLR cameras tend to have larger sensor sizes and can have very large sensor sizes. That can impact the image quality and the ISO look, the graininess that you might get to an image. Um, but there's a lot of options there. Now there's micro four thirds cameras that are that are kind of blending that gap, uh, sort of you know in between here somewhere. Um, but it's all the usual sort of pros and cons where a cell phone's going to be a lot lighter. Uh, it's always with you. Uh, it has integrated GPS for years, de like a decade or more now. Uh, cell phones have had GPS and maps services that you can use to take a picture of something and then geolocate it if you put it on an app like iNaturalist, which I would highly encourage everyone to download if they haven't gotten it already. Uh, use iNaturalist can help you identify your organisms. And the critical thing is you can upload photos that you take with even just your cell phone, geotagged and located to a database that researchers like myself um, can go in and access and understand the spatial distribution of a species or understand range extensions or historic ranges of species. It's very important for conservation biology, understanding, for example, what plants can be found at the Shoal Creek uh, river system, you know, uh, watershed, uh, what that, you know, the health of the can communicate about the health of the watershed. It's very interesting and important information. And you can do that so easily with the cell phone. SLRs, this, this camera, this thing costs like thousands of dollars and it doesn't have a GPS unit. So I, I've often taken a photo and then I take a photo with my cell phone of the back of my camera so that I can have a GPS info uh, on it. Nikon will sell you for like 300 bucks a, a GPS unit you can put on there. And the newer SLR cameras can communicate with your cell phone. And I've done that sometimes. But it's so cumbersome that the cell phones are great at that. Point and shoots do that pretty much as well. Um, that said, they are uh, they don't have as much flexibility or options in terms of lighting, manual control, things like that. That's where the SLRs really shine is making an image rather than taking an image. Um, so I'll go through again some pro quick pros and cons with the cell phones. It's always with you, always there, connected, GPS, easy to carry. And it's really good at wide angle macro. It's okay at, at the regular macro. You could add on, and I'll talk about these in a little bit, a clip-on type of lens. Um, but there's there's a few options, but not very much. Limited control. Uh, you could, one thing I would suggest is downloading possibly even a different camera app than the default app that controls the camera that your phone comes with. Look for an app that gives you access to, opens up, access to shutter speed and manual control, uh, change manually controlling the focus. Some of them, some of the camera apps will even do that. Um, you have this limited focal range. It's not gonna be great at taking a picture of a bald eagle off in the in the clouds. Um, so a little bit just, you know, limited flexibility and, and lighting is always, is always tricky with those. Uh, so this is probably an image that I suspect a lot of people have. Me, I've been a photographer for, for years and years and years, and I'm so good at taking these images <laughs> all the time. Beautiful, beautiful in-focus background, and my subject is a blur. <laughs> the thing I actually wanted to photograph is this little, uh, the little new growth of the citrus tree in the front here. I work on a project with uh, Asian citrus psyllid, which is a, a pest insect that spreads a bacterial disease. It's wiping out citrus across the nation. Um, or has potential to. 
uh, and I wanted to show a photo of that to my friend who who was asking about the Citrus on History. So I took this great image and totally <laughs> missed focus on it. But I took a second image and was able to get what it actually is, these little white stringy things. This is some um, product of the, of the psyllid nymphs. Um, and what you can see is I used my hand to kind of preset the focus uh, and was able to, to get my camera to lock on to that part of the image. And then I could, could hit the actual uh, capture button. Now, I, I didn't take my own advice. I haven't downloaded a, a different camera app right now. So my cell phone that I have, it doesn't allow me to chain, to lock the focus. But if you get a camera app that allows you to do that, you could pre-focus on your hand, press lock, and then move over. And you would have, your focus plane would be like this far, say, from your subject. And then you could just move your camera in and out until it gets into focus and then hit capture. That's a really good tip for getting better close-up images or something that you might want to upload to iNaturalist or, or try to get an identification on, something like that. Um, my biggest tips with cell phone macro are to get closer, get closer than you think, and then get even closer than that. <laughs> Pinch zoom in a little bit. That can help with the, just the optics on the, um, the, the actual lenses of the, of the cell phone camera. Uh, and might give you a little bit sharper image. There can sometimes be a little sweet spot in that focus distance where you get zoomed in so you get a higher resolution, but you're not losing the benefit of uh, having the, the close focus distance that you can get with a wider angle. Um, again, lock that focus point and then recompose by moving in and out until you see a sharp focus. Uh, and you can always use, you know, your hand is always with you. Um, so that's a good thing to use as the background to, for something to lock onto. And again, adding light, adding some kind of secondary source with your other hand, uh, or maybe you need three hands, <laughs> is uh, is usually good, especially if you can just soften it up by passing it through a, a tissue in your pocket or a, a white t-shirt, anything like that. Um, these clip-on lenses, I'll talk about those real briefly. Uh, they They are great. They work pretty darn well. Um, and you can get some really cool, interesting images with those. The image quality is not fantastic, but it is what it is. Um, there's rubber band type of ones, clip-on lenses, little screw-on ones, uh, lots of options. I would, um, when you're using these, it helps to pinch zoom in quite a bit, zoom in on, on your camera's app quite a bit. Uh, that avoids that halo, that vignette uh, that you get by shooting through. Uh, one of these, you probably want to take your case off maybe or find a, a clip-on lens that's compatible with your case. There are even some cases that have built-in lenses that you can change onto these. Definitely get closer and get keep getting closer than you think because the minimum focus distance, what this really does is kind of alters the minimum focus distance. So you really need to get, I mean, you know, like this close to your, to your subjects. Um, you're gonna kind of lose autofocus with this, so it helps to just kind of guide in and out and find your focus like you would with a microscope. But the biggest thing with this is I would absolutely go for the smallest magnification value you can find. This is a 10X macro. You can buy like 30 or 40X macros, and they're 40 bucks, 50 bucks, and they look great. They have this big you know, honking lens on there, and it's, it's really cool. They're top sellers on Amazon. But I suspect most people that buy them then they put them on, they're like, whoa, this is way too much. You can take photos of salt grains. You can take photos of, you know, snowflakes. But you try to take a photo of a bee, and where the focus is, if you have a really zoomed in, like a, a 30x macro lens, your focus distance is, I mean, like a couple millimeters. So you're taking a picture of the bee's eye. And if that's a bee sitting on a flower, it's probably going to fly away from you before you even, you know, get close. So they can be a little frustrating. These cheap... The cheap ones that are like six bucks from any brand name you can try to pronounce um, are are really good, uh, actually better than the more expensive uh, zoomed in ones, unless you're doing photos of salt grains if you want to do that. Point and shoot cameras uh, are also lightweight, easy to carry, lots of, uh, well, a little bit of flexibility, some controls on there. Again, really good for wide angle macro with the optics of lenses but you usually can't swap out the lenses. Um, so you're kind of stuck with what's on there. Same with a, a cell phone camera. So you might be limited to the focal range. You have limited flexibility again. 
and limited lighting options, they usually, many of them don't have a hot shoe that you can mount something to. So if you are looking for a point and shoot camera, especially there's this gray area where the cost and the features blend into the cheapest SLRs. Um, and SLRs have, have a lot of flexibility, but what I would look for in a point and shoot is, is that range of focus. Uh, if you want to photograph, you know, eagles off in the distance, maybe look at that Nikon P9000 where you can zoom to, you know, Mars and back. Um, but also look for, for a point and shoot camera that might have a hot shoe on it. This, this um, little bracket area here that can hold and communicate a flat to a flash. So you can light your subject with flashlight. Um, look for, look for point and shoots that give you Mac, uh, manual focus, manual capabilities, uh, on all those. And those are some of the better, uh, bets to get. You also have some limited responsiveness. The thing I really like about SLRs is right when I press the button, the camera fires for the most part. Um, and you get a lot of that with cell phones or, or a point and shoot. I always get the point and shoots where you press it and about six seconds later, it, it takes the image and my hummingbird has flown away. Um, so they're, they're a little tough. SLRs have a lot of uh, pros. They're very responsive. You have, can have full control, uh, lots of lighting lens options. I can put this lens on and photograph birds. I can put this lens on and photograph a wedding couple. Uh, you know, sometimes I photograph birds at weddings and then I forget why I'm there. <laughs> and the image quality, obviously on a, on a SLR is pretty much but you know, uh, the, the best you can get from, from any of these other cameras. Although again, I haven't shot with the newest iPhones or the newest, whatever Google, uh, phones coming out, but they are expensive. Uh, there's a lot of weight and a lot of complexity that can be really intimidating, uh, at first, uh, the limited connectivity thing just still gets me. I don't, I don't understand how you don't have GPS on some of these already. Um, but if you are getting an SLR, I would absolutely stick with it. Take some workshop classes, uh, you know, contact me. I'd be happy to, to help point you to resources or, or help do one-to-one um, -one instruction kind of things on just getting up to speed with how to, to, to take images uh, with these. If you are looking for an SLR, um, the macro lenses I would suggest would be something probably in the 100 range. Nikon has a great 100, um, 105 millimeter. That's what's on here. And that's what I use for the most part, uh, for most of my images. Uh, Canon, the nice thing about Canon is you can get this 65 millimeter MPE lens that goes from one X to five X. So this thing can zoom in and take pictures of salt grains if you wanted to, but it's a very, I wouldn't recommend this for beginners. It's a very, um, com it's a difficult lens, uh, to get used to. Uh, I'm sure you know, you, you absolutely could do it, but you probably have more, more easier success, uh, with like an autofocus 100 lens. And usually people start with that and then move to this if they want to get closer. There are, there is another option for Nikon shooters and for other folks as well, Canon shooters as well, uh, which is this Laowa, um, 25 millimeter that goes from 2.5 X to five X. But again, that's very, uh, you're almost talking microscope objectives. They're, they're specialized to very, very small things like you know, millimeter long, uh, things. One of the lenses I would probably recommend the most right now is this Laowa 10 millimeter. I think it's, uh, sorry, hundred, that should say hundred millimeter, um, macro lens. This is, uh, four, four or $500, five dollars maybe. Um, it does not have autofocus, but it can go from one to two X. So it kind of combines the best of a really close in macro, uh, lens with the ease and flexibility of, of the, uh, more, um, of the one X lens with aperture coupling. I haven't talked about that and I won't, but, um, this is, this is just a really good all around lens that's, that's come out pretty recently and might be one of the things I would suggest the most, uh, to people looking at, uh, buying a macro lens right now. Um, there are other options for SLRs and even point and shoots, uh, that you can use these, um, some of these mounts will actually mount onto a point and shoot as well. This is a thing called a Raynox diopter. This is the Raynox 250. And that's what I have here. I have it on threads so I can just screw it on and attach it to the front of my lens if and, if and when I want to use that. Um, and what this does is basically it's, it's putting a magnifying glass over your lens. Uh, it's just 
adds an additional layer of magnification. And that can be a really good option if you already have an SLR, like a kit lens or something like that. That can get you into macro territory quite cheaply. I think these are 70 bucks or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing you could use uh, would be to use a set of extension tubes. And extension tubes, all they do, they're they're a hollow um, they're a hollow tube that you can you know stick your finger through. Um, these simply extend your lens further away from the focal plane and make it such that you you can get a a smaller minimum focus distance. So you can force a lens that only focuses you know as close as a couple of feet to more like a couple of inches. Uh, and you can maximize getting closer, zooming in closer with one of those lenses. Um, you can also do that with a uh, bellows. This is a bellows kit where you can automatically sort of adjust that or, or without having to pull it apart to pieces. Um, you can also do a reverse mount ring. And what, what you do with one of these reverse mount rings is you take, for example, a prime lens. Prime lenses work really well for this. And normally what you would do is this is the front of the lens and I would mount it on my camera with all these electronic aperture couplings here. What you do instead is you screw the front of the lens to the camera and you attach it backwards. So you end up um, photographing through the lens backwards uh, like, oops, like that. So then my lens is on there backwards but it's like looking through a, a pair of binoculars backwards. Uh, if you've ever done that, that's a great uh, thing to do if you're bored um, on your next nature walk is to take your pair of binoculars and use them to look at birds, uh, but then flip them around and look through them backwards at some of the critters that are uh, you know, on the, on the flowers or something like that. And you can see some really cool detail uh, in that. So lots of options, uh, some of which work for point and shoots, not so much for, for cell phones. Again, there are the lighting options um, that I talked about. I'm using that KX800, again, is, is one that I really like. It works, it works really well. Um, but lots of options for you there. And again, diffusion really helps soften up the shadows and give you these really nice um, catch lights, things like that. So. I want to kind of end with some tips, uh, my top tips that I'll just kind of breeze through and then end with a, an example of uh, a photo that I kind of worked at that was a bad photo and I made it maybe not a great photo, but certainly a better photo. Um, and I used all of these tips when I was doing that. My first tip, my biggest tip, by far the best thing for any kind of photography, it doesn't matter your, your tools, your equipment, doesn't matter if you have the most expensive lens, the most expensive camera. The main piece of advice I could ever give to somebody that wants to get into photography is to know your subject, is to really know everything about the insect you're trying to catch, uh, to, to capture on film, uh, what makes it interesting, what makes it biology unique, where you can go look for that critter in your environment, how not to scare it off if you're approaching it with this big bulky camera, for example. Um, so to get this picture of a jumping spider launching off uh, to, to another perch site, you have to know that a jumping spider is going to come to the end of this twig. And I was actually pushing her with a, a paintbrush and encouraging her to, <laughs> to line up here, know that she was going to jump, know to position all your equipment in the right way to capture that jump. So that takes knowing the biology of a jumping spider. Um, to know how to set up in advance to capture something like this. Same with an emerging uh, uh, mosquito. You need to know when it's going to emerge. So when, is that 24 hours after they lay their eggs? Is that 72 hours? I actually, now that I'm saying that, I completely forget. But I looked it up for this. You can look up primary literature or go on Google Scholar or something like that. Um, or probably just Wikipedia has, has a lot of information um, for some a lot of these species. I think this is Aedes aegypticus. Um, and I happened to have a, uh, a lab next to the lab that I work in that rears these. So I had a, access to a clean, sterile colony that I could rear out uh, on a workbench and wait until that precise moment. It's only about, I don't know, 90 seconds or something where they pull out and get on top of the water uh, and go from an aquatic larva to a flying terrestrial adult. Um, 
And so I set this image up by putting the larvae uh, down here in a little uh, pool of water, having my lighting set up, having a background set up, and getting ready in anticipation of getting that image. Um, so it also helps to know your equipment. So I knew to s all of the features of these flashes to set all this up, and it was kind of uh, second nature when I was setting this up just to focus on the precise timing to get that shot. Um, so I put this image to show you that, oh my God, cameras are complicated. There's so much going on. Don't worry about trying to read any of this. Just know that all of this information is at your disposal in your camera's manual or something like that. But the real way to get it to work for you is to practice, 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 work with your camera, play with its functions, set up a shoot just to, hey, what happens if I use flash and just burn burn a couple of pixels? The nice thing is it's all digital these days. You're not paying for rolls of film to experiment with. And I would highly encourage people to experiment and figure out what lighting works or what combinations work. I have like a recipe I can go to, um, but I've developed that of shooting for a while. Um, one good tip with this is to download your camera's manual uh, as a PDF onto your cell phone. And then you can always go, okay, what was the exposure compensation for flash where, where what menu setting do I go in to find that on a Nikon D500 and I can, I can find it. Um, I, so I say all that about knowing your equipment because that helps you forget about the equipment in order to focus on tip number one, which is your subject. And that's what your whole attention should be given to, but knowing that you've set everything up so that you can get the shot that you want when that, subject does that behavior or something like that. Um, proper hand-holding technique is really important for macro photography. You want to, I see a lot of people holding a, a camera this this way or just holding it, you know, with, with two hands, you know, two fingers or something like that and shooting with their arms out or not even really looking through. That's why I have this, this rubber eye cup here so I can literally shove my eye into my camera uh, and use that as another point of stability. I've often left eye marks on, on the little piece of glass in there. Um, and you want to suck everything in tight. This is where it helps to have some extra girth like I do. Um, so really brace yourself and, and keep a steady hand when you're, when you're moving in uh, to focus on something. You can shoot from a tripod and that kind of uh, obviates the, the necessity for that. Um, you can use some of these ground pods are, are real good to, to put on the side of a car or down on the ground. But if you want to be, uh, if you don't want to pay that much money and you're like me, I, I always look for a cheap solution to the same thing. Uh, you can just fill a Ziploc bag full of sand or dirt or something. And you can always, that's why I always carry a Ziploc with me in the field. Um, you can use that as, as like a little stabilizer to do longer exposures or anything like that. I would highly encourage people to check out um, Moose Peterson's a fantastic wildlife, mostly does wildlife mammal bird photography, um, but he has a good series on camera settings, hand holding technique, everything for getting the best sharpness uh, out of your camera. Cause that's another thing that people often struggle with is you, you tend to get blurry images, especially with macro. Um, getting closer is such a good big tip for just making the, your images sing. Um, this is a pretty good shot of a beetle, well lit. It's it's you know nicely exposed, and this could be good for identification. Um, but I kind of moved around the beetle, found a little bit different angle uh, that gives a little more jet, what I call gesture, just the 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 look and the communicating some of the emotions of of how cool this beetle is or what your viewer wants to see. And then if you get even closer, even at a different angle. You can get this shot, which I, f I find is a lot more, um, again, emotionally striking. It, it just pulls at your heartstrings a lot more. You, you ascribe all these emotions to what, what you're seeing in the image. And that's, that's what's really cool about macro photography. These are just fine images uh, for trying to identify the spider, for example. The image here on the, on the right is a pretty darn good image. This is something I pulled off of iNaturalist, where somebody has put this photo up and you were able to, they were able to get an identification as to what species of wolf spider this is because it has all the important details. And I would definitely recommend people get, you know, a diagnostic shot of their subject, especially with insects where I've been an entomologist almost my whole life. 
and I can't identify 90% of the things, the insects that I see because there's so many of them. So it helps to get a diagnostic image of what I'm photographing so that I can identify that in my photos later um, or understand what the heck I'm even, even shooting. Um, but most of the pictures that I get in my inbox are this one on the left and it's, you know, what insect is this? And it's some blurry <laughs> thing that I have to, you know, go, go try to figure out on someone's behalf. Um, but you can get closer than this image to get a good diagnostic image, but then moving beyond a diagnostic image, if you want an image that really pops and hits your viewer in the face, you have to get into the spider's face. And this is a wolf spider that this image just has a lot of more character, a lot of pop, uh, because you're so much closer. You've cropped out the legs, you know, even around the outside of the, the image. Uh, and you're really just focused on how cool the spider's, I think, how cool the spider's face is. Hopefully there's no arachnophobes uh, out there watching this because there's going to be a lot of spider photos. <laughs> uh, so that goes part and parcel as well with the composition. Um, really going back and just paying mindful attention to what you're actually putting in your in your photo i'm very guilty of always just you know seeing something going ah click get a photo and i get a decent photo but um it helps if you can get lower angle uh add those leading lines in try to balance the color have, have bright areas and dark areas things like that um and i just have to throw this photo up uh, Diane Odzimar, I'm, I'm not sure I'm mispronouncing that completely, um, but I just found her on Facebook through some other groups and started following her work, and it's awesome. Um, I would highly recommend that you find photographers that you like and look at their work and, and look at what makes for an interesting image here. This is another image that's much better than if she just took a photo of a chipmunk and, and it was like right in the middle of the frame. Here there's some tension, it's a little bit off the frame, Again, your eye goes right to the to the eye, to the bright, sharp area there. Maybe it wanders down here. Maybe you have a leading line in the background that brings you right back to the face of this chipmunk, and you just kind of can't help but it's hard to look away from this image. And that's what makes a great image. Um, and really learning to see the light uh, that that you're putting onto the subject. Uh, this is a great example from Alex Wild uh, of using a bare twin flash and what you can see if you really look at what the lighting is on this you can see two really bright spots uh on on the ant that's from the bare flash bulbs going off you get this much uh, a pretty harsh shadow <clears throat> underneath uh the subject and this is like taking a, a party photo or a wedding photo or something in the middle of harsh noon sunlight, right? You're, you're, you take the photo and it just never looks good. Uh, it doesn't look as good as the well-lit, professionally lit uh, shots at sunset, something like that. So what Alex does with his macro photography technique, his whole diffusion technique is to try to mimic a cloudy day because a cloudy day is this big blanket of diffusion that goes uh, un underneath the sun, which is this bright point source of light. And if you can diffuse and spread that out over your subject, as he's doing here with a piece of Roscoe Lux diffusion paper and, and ways he set up his diffusion to really, you can see a lot more detail in the ant without it getting blown out or being these harsh contrast um, shadows and highlights. And you can do that yourself. Again, I encourage people to experiment with what works for you for, for getting a, a setup to go out and take awesome macro pictures at Shoal Creek um, would be to try with your camera with just the bare flash you might end up getting this jumping spider. And this is this jumping spider right here that I can I can pull out for folks if anybody wants to. Um, and you can see a bright point source of light, harsh shadows underneath her, uh, shooting through just a little small modified diffuser. And I have some Amazon links I can put uh, to, to these diffusers for people if they want. Uh, softens up those shadows quite a bit, makes for a nice catch light uh, in the eyes. Or going all the way to something like a setup that I have over here, where it's a, a big white box made out of uh, uh, card or the, uh, foam foam board, foam core, uh, where I'm, sh I'm flashing lights into it and making this big white diffuse uh, area that a spider can go in. Uh, it really helps soften up the shadows and produce an interesting catch light. It's, you, you wanna also pay attention to the catch light that is in the eyes of these spiders. You can see this is really a sharp point source of light 
this actually has quite a pleasing catch light, a, a sort of, you know, it's like almost the anime anime eyes or the cartoon eyes. If you draw an eyeball, you usually put a catch light in there to, to show light reflecting off it. Um, and you want to mimic that or do the same with your with your photos. Um, and these, uh, you know, in a white box, you might, I, I, I sometimes don't find it very pleasing catch light, actually, even though the lighting is very good. Um, sometimes the catch light isn't what I'm going for, but this is just an example to show you how to how to take some different lighting lit images and to experiment with them and see what find a solution that that works for you. So I want to end with um, what I call working the image. What I call th this is a image that I got to from a much worse image, and I just kind of worked it, pushed it, tweaked it, got closer, added lighting to where I got an image that's much um, more pleasing, uh, one that I can use for identification purposes, things like that. Um, so this was actually not with a macro lens. This was with this um, big old 500 lens. I was out photographing birds at a park, but I usually carry in a little um, you know, fanny pack pouch type of thing or in my backpack. Uh, I'll carry like a diopter and or I'll carry some, uh, some extension tubes to help if, in case I do see a bird even or an insect that's very close and I can at least make an attempt at catching it. So this isn't the best image. I maybe do better with like a dedicated macro lens, but this just explains how I got to this image. Um, so walking up on the damselfly, uh, just using that lens and no lighting or anything, I got this image. And so this might be a common image that people might take and want to you know, try to do better. Um, so the first thing I knew I needed to add was to add some lighting. So I put a uh, speed light in the hot shoe right here on top of the camera. So this is shooting down the, the lens axis of this long lens that I'm shooting at 500 millimeters. Um, and that takes this image and just brightens it up. And what you can see is you can see a little bit more detail in the abdominal segments, the venation. These are important things for identification, for example. And it also brightens up and just adds some pop to the image. Um, but I also knew I needed to get closer. So I put on a full set of extension tubes. This is, um, th they usually sell them in three packs of different lengths of extension tubes. And I put the whole canister on there to try to get as close to reduce my focus distance as much as I could to get a, a bigger image area uh, in the resultant image. And you move from this with the flash light to now going closer with the same flash. And this isn't cropped. This is just a closer uh, zoomed in area. So this has the same pixel count as this image, um, but just zoomed in. And then what I wanted to do was the background wasn't ex exactly pleasing and I wanted to maximize getting a clean shot of the side and, and the background falling away. So I moved and changed my composition to get to an image where I had a nice green background and, and some um, definition around the wings, things like that. So I went from that starter image of just clicking an image to sitting, and it took me about uh, 10, 10 minutes to add some components, work the image, get close to this damselfly without scaring it off, being comfortable approaching it to where I got what I find is a much better image. Uh, and which again, I ended up taking a <laughs> picture of with my, cam my cell phone of the back of the camera, just so I could upload it to iNaturalist, get an ID, uh, for it and, and upload it there. So that's something I would absolutely encourage y'all to do would be to um, keep working your images, get a real nice image, and then share that image either on Facebook, on your own website, uh, but definitely you can share your cool images that also give some really interesting, important conservation data uh, to scientists if you go on iNaturalist or some pages like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so with that, I can take any questions that we might have gotten in over the email. If there's lots of stuff I didn't cover, I, this was a quick ramshackle run through lots of uh, uh, macro options. And I'll also um, leave some links up here, a QR for my Facebook, uh, my web page. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at ENMWrite86. Uh, and then on Instagram, I'm ENMWrite86. And I also have tiny spheres where I make little three uh, uh, 3D sphere planet toy things for fun. So <laughs> photography is a lot of fun. I know it's not exactly easy to do it with COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, going on right now, 
Uh, it's certainly not easy to take a workshop, but this would be a good time to sit at home and practice with your camera, even if it's your cell phone, kind of work the image and maximize what you can do with the image um, and then share it with other people who are sitting on their couch bored too uh, so that we can all see some cool pictures of, of jumping spiders and things like that. So Maria, do we have any uh, questions from the feed? So we do not, but I have a few questions. And Please do. that can give some people some time if they want to email in anything. Um, Excellent. My, my question uh, is, how did you get into photography in the first place? That's a really good question. Uh, I, I, it, I don't remember any specific incident. There are some people who go, oh man, I, I remember this one frog that just, oh, that was it. I just kind of have always been into photography. Um, I did. I remember having like a point and shoot uh, film camera growing up when I went on uh, like cruise vacations and I was always taking photos of like the lizards. I think my sister would take photos of, you know, actual people or friends that she met. <laughs> and so I would always do that. But I did get my first SLR as a graduation present in 2008 when I uh, graduated from undergrad. And um, th and with that, I shot with the kit lens for a while until about a year later, I bought a macro lens for it. That's the same lens that I'm using. Mm -hmm. um, and that got started getting me really into, once I started getting these close, crisp images of the, in the things I was already interested in, which are mostly insects and herps, um, lizards and snakes and frogs and things like that. Uh, and I started getting cool images of those. I was like, okay, this is neat and I can start doing it. And um, I, I've just always really enjoyed see visually communicating things, visually communicating science and um, just looking at good photos. I, I love looking at, you know, photography competitions or the photo displays at like a natural history museum or something like that. There's something about that visual uh, communication in, in a still image that has always pulled me. Um, and so it was once I got an SLR, it was no turning back. I just kept going and going. And now I have way too much equipment <laughs> to go with it, but it's a lot of, it's a very fun hobby. So. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, do you think there's any like particular type of photo that inspires you or, um, like has, and has that changed through time? Uh, pictures. yeah, it, it, it can change. It's, um, and man, depending on, I mean, I've seen some images that almost prompted me to buy a lens right there right now. For example, I, I've hardly done any underwater photography and I have some crummy underwater housings, but I'm like, man, I really, I really want to buy a, uh, a new underwater housing, um, that that's like a proper one. Um, cause man, I'm seeing lots of really cool work from, uh, Steven David Johnson on, on Facebook, Seth Patterson. There's, there's a lot of guys who are just doing just really cool underwater shots. And I'm like, man, that's a cool new aspect of natural history. Like there's awesome underwater stuff in, uh, Shoal Creek. There's probably Cephenids and little cool beetles and, and dragonfly naiads and all this cool stuff. I'm like, okay, I, I, love to do that. So it, it can change like every time I, I look at something new, but I really enjoy following. Um, yeah. Nikki Bay, John Abbott, uh, Thomas Shahan's great jumping spider. Photo. Just there's so many um, go onto those like Facebook macro communities and stuff. I would recommend people uh, looking at um, cause man, it's just so cool and so much fun to see all these different images and just take inspiration from that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And usually it, I think it changes a lot with like what my interest is at the time. If I'm really after, uh, if I just was photographing with my long lens and I see some really cool pictures of bird, like portraits of birds, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's, that's my jam right now. But then it might be wide angle shots of scorpions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, who knows what else, but. Uh. Well, speaking of which, uh, I, I did get a couple of questions that came in and Excellent. Um, one is do do you have a favorite insect to photograph? Oh man. Uh, that's, that's like, you know, like a favorite at, child. that's like asking who your favorite child is, except <laughs> that there's one, 1 million nearly <laughs> described children out there. There's, there's right. nearly a million species of them. So, uh, I will say not an insect, but spiders. I really like photographing jumping spiders and that's yeah. probably what, what most got me into macro. 
Um, that and butterflies, I started really doing doing butterflies. As you can see in my photo here, um, man, butterflies are the gateway drug to entomology. Absolutely. Um, you start looking at those and, and you start getting into, you know, safenids and, and right. all, all sorts of other stuff. <laughs> ones that pull you in. But yeah, jumping spiders are really, um, they're big eyes. They're very cluey. They're very um, curious and, and have cool behaviors. Uh, so, so yeah, th that would, that would be one of my top things that I always aim to shoot when I go somewhere. Yeah. Your pictures absolutely make them look so adorable. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's part of the goal. Kind of, you know, close up view of them to, to really get to appreciate, you know, those silly characteristics of absolutely like, guys and things like that. And everybody should, uh, should make friends with jumping spiders. I'll see if I can hold her up. Ooh, ooh, ooh. There we go. So this is one that I have uh, that I like to photograph a lot. Um, and they're just, they're, they're cool. They run around, they're, they're very active. They're, they're really neat. So again, I apologize if anybody has arachnophobia, that is a legitimate fear, um, but they're, they're not to be, you know, feared. They're, they're really cool organisms uh, that are a lot of fun to play with. Very, very nice for photographers for a lot of reasons. So. Um, I also received a question that says you have a favorite spot to take pictures along Shoal Creek. Oh man. Uh, I haven't, I'm, I'm, if we didn't say this already, I'm, I'm back in Southern California now working at UC Riverside. Um, so I haven't been in Austin for four, almost four years now, which I'm very sad about. Uh, Austin's this phenomenal, uh, place. Uh, Shoal Creek itself, I've actually probably mostly photographed sort of waterfalls and riffles and things like that mm -hmm. along Shoal Creek, like the, the, some of the riffly, oh, yeah. um, areas kind of, kind of off trail and some of the overlooks and things. So those are my favorite spots as far as the, the photography that I've done there. Um, but yeah, so I, I it's been so long that I don't, I don't have any specific spots there. One of my favorite places actually for catching snakes is, has been the Barton Creek green belt. That's a, that's a nice little close area to um, where I've seen a lot of uh, uh, green uh, rough green snakes um, mm -hmm. that are really cool. Uh, lots of different things like that. I was lucky that I, I did my graduate work at, at UT Austin. So I got to be on um, uh, uh, BFL Brackenridge field lab and mm -hmm. I got to photograph there a lot, um, which is not, on you know the 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 riverway necessarily what's well, next to the river they're not on the Shoal Creek stream but um, mm -hmm. but what's nice about that is they had a lot of different ecosystems there were, there were flower beds there were river systems so I, I like a lot of diversity uh, mm -hmm. in that but where I would probably recommend people go um, especially at, at an area that's that's a cool creek or a cool conservancy area like this would be definitely sort of the shoreline, the integrated shoreline is always a, a great spot where there's water for animals, there's vegetation, there's like a turnover in vegetation from the more woodland kind of oak, you know, mixed oak, savanna type of vegetation until as you get to the shoreline. There can be some really cool organisms there. That's definitely a spot I would look for. Um, really cool dragonflies. There are some great gomphid club tail dragonflies that are that are like this big and look like they're literally called dragons and and dragon eaters and tiger they have all these cool common names yeah. um because they're just outstanding critters so um yeah that that's where i would look is, is kind of hunting that shoreline looking mm -hmm. for predatory flies looking for you know things like that there's a lot yeah. of areas there. and you know the riparian zone um near a lot well along uh the creek in peace park there oh, yeah. are that are like truly they feel very wild and um i think for some of the things that you're mentioning um i would certainly suggest that people go out and flex their photography muscles there for sure definitely um, peace park is is fantastic especially those areas as you say you can tuck away uh mm -hmm. even more so right now i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, Excellent. Well, I have not received any other questions. Um, Sounds good. But I, what I wanted to say was thank you so much for spending your Friday 
early evening with us and sharing all of your expertise. And um, we will be posting this on YouTube later so people can come back and watch again or, you know, reference for particular things that they might, you know, want to revisit. And uh, Ian was so nice to put all this contact information on here. So please, everybody, don't hesitate to reach out to him or me if you have um, some questions. And I hope that y'all take some photos along Shoal Creek. Um, please tag us and use hashtags like Shoal Creek or Shoal Creek Conservancy or Shoal Creek Trail. All of those we'll see. And we love sharing that kind of stuff on our social media. So um, it's fun for, for all of us to see what kind of photos you're taking. And if you're not sure how to access Shoal Creek, if you go to our website, which is www.shoalcreekconservancy.org, um, you can navigate to the map page, which on the left side, there are a bunch of layers on a Google map that you can toggle. And so you can remove everything except the trail entrances, um, our trailheads, which have a little information of where you can park. So definitely get out there, explore the creek, and take some pictures, y'all. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, you guys. This was phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.